Hello, I'm Jay Smith, Senior Pastor at State Street United Methodist Church. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this service of worship. If you do not have a church home, I want to invite you to join us in person each Sunday morning at 8.08 and 10 a.m. We're located at the corner of State and 11th Streets in Bowling Green. And you can also find us on our website at www.statestreetumc.org. And now may you be blessed by this service of worship. Good morning. One of the most beloved greetings in the church is grace and peace and your responses and also with you. Grace and peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. I'm glad to welcome you. If you're a guest visiting today, my name is Jay Smith. I'm really pleased that you've come to worship God and to worship with us today. A lot of places you could be, but you've chosen to worship God. And we're glad that you've come our way today. If you are a, vis a visitor, a guest with us, a couple of things. There are Get Connected cards on the pews all around you. We'd love to reconnect with you about the ministries of our church. Just fill out that card. You can bring it to me at the center back doors after the service. Or there will be a member of our hospitality team to my left, your right, the double doors on 11th Street there. Someone would be glad to greet you and give you a gift as well then. I'm glad all of you are here today, but perhaps yesterday you had time to pause and to give God thanks uh, for veterans in our uh, midst, and I, we wanted to just acknowledge those of you that uh, are veterans in our church family. Would you please stand, those of you that are veterans, this Veterans Day holiday. Yes. Yes. Friends, be aware, this Tuesday is the Bazaar, and uh, it's a great day, one of the best in the life of State Street. Uh, we'll give away eight to $10,000 that we'll raise on Tuesday to missions and ministries in this community and beyond. You need to be aware, particularly, it's time for pie, okay? We need pie, and literally, we need pie. We try to figure that each household, if you could bring two pies, that will get us through Bazaar. So if you got your pies, please bring those in. There will be someone to greet you as early as 7 o'clock Tuesday morning uh, to get your pie from you. So bring those by. We need pies. If you cut them, that's even more helpful, and you'll get a gold jewel in your crown of glory someday. So do that as, if you can. But several things in the bulletin related to how you can help with the Bazaar, and we commend those to you. Many, if not most of you are aware that we're in the midst of a capital campaign. Our church will be 200 years old in 2020, and we're celebrating that. We're looking to the future. We're planning for the future, what the next 200 years might look like. And so uh, please be aware that if you haven't seen one of the detailed brochures, which has the most up-to-date information, it answers most of the questions on the ends of the bell tables, also the ends of the altar, uh, altar rail, also the entrances into the sanctuary, there are brochures just like this one, and I hope you'll pick one up if you haven't accessed one or found one in some other means. We want you to have those and take those with you. The banners before us have been prepared. We had Ministry Sunday a couple of Sundays ago. We're thankful. They remind us of what we're really here for, to represent Christ in this community and beyond, and we're grateful for them. Today, uh, we, we focus really on the strong future aspect, and when we think of the future of our church, we think of children, we think of youth, and a few weeks ago, we uh, had some of our kids share with us uh, related to the strong future. And uh, here's what they had to say and share. If you want to share it? There you go. That is fantastic. Am I welcome here? Am I safe to sing or laugh or shed a tear? Will I be 
<laughs> How good is that? It is strong foundation, strong future. As the kids reminded us, you are welcome here. I don't know where you came from to get here today, but you are welcome here. And we're all here for the exact same reason. And that's to worship God. I'm so glad you've come. Let us worship the Lord. A wonderful way to start worship together. I now invite you to stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin, taken from Psalms 138, verses 1 through 3. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple. I give thanks to your name. Your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You strengthened my life. 
And now as we remain standing, I invite you to join in singing our opening hymn of praise this morning, number 529 in your red hymnal, How Firm a Foundation. Remain standing as you're able, and let's join our voices together in the historic affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin. Would you join with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. You can find it on uh, page 1146 in the Pew Bible and page 1801 in the large print version. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did this, not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I do want to lift up the flowers on the altar over here in front of the pulpit. Those flowers have been placed there by Leslie Watkins. Many of you know that Leslie's father, Reverend Doug Mosley, passed away this week, and they had his services yesterday at Broadway United Methodist, and I know that you will join me in continuing to pray for Leslie and the rest of the Mosley family as they grieve the loss of their father. And now I invite you to join in singing the third verse of number 354, I Surrender All. Let's pray. Almighty and holy God, we humbly come before you this morning as your children, gathered as your church family, and grateful to be in your presence. Today we celebrate together all the ministries that have happened through this church family, and we celebrate especially those people that you have touched through the members of this church family and through its ministries. In just a week, we will make our pledges to use our blessings to bless this church in the future so that even more might be reached in your name. Guide us in discerning what you want to do through us. We ask your blessings on the bazaar that's coming up this week so that those efforts will produce even more that we might give to others. We thank you for all those who are working tirelessly to make this event happen. Help us to continue to live out that love, that unity, and generosity in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, so that the world might get a glimpse of your kingdom come here on earth. In that kingdom, we know that there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain, and there will be no more fighting. But there certainly seems to be plenty of all of those things to go around for now. We pray for a peaceful resolution to all the conflicts that surround us and all of the conflicts that are within us. And Jesus said there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So today we pray for those men and women who have in their military service sacrificed their time, their strength, their ambition, their health, and even their lives here on this earth to benefit friends both known and unknown. We thank you for all of our service men and women both past and present who defend our country and through whose sacrifices we enjoy the rights and freedoms we too often take for granted. 
We ask for your protection over them and your blessings on their families who sacrifice in different ways, but surely sacrifice. Let none feel forgotten, neglected, or alone. And Lord, certainly we are um, have the potential to feel the same way, whether we are in military service or not. And so we ask for your blessing, for your comfort, for those whose circumstances leave them struggling. We mourn with all the families and friends this week who've had to say goodbye to those they love, some of whom live many full years and others who expected to have years and years ahead to enjoy together. When there are no words to describe our grief, hear what our hearts are saying, God, and let us hear your still small voice of love and care through the pain. We know that our trust and hope does not rest in our own hands or in the hands of any other individual or even a group of people. But we rest in the pierced hands of our incomparable Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we bring this prayer and that we pray together the prayer he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You have heard how you can help with the bazaar this week. I want to uh, mention again to you that Room in the Inn starts next Sunday. We still have some openings for hosts. Those are posted outside on the bulletin board outside the office. We would invite you to consider being a part of that ministry with homeless in our community. And also the Thanksgiving meal is just around the corner. There are openings for you to help on Wednesday. And on Thursday, we particularly need delivery drivers as 800 of the 1,000 meals that we plan to serve will need to be delivered. So I encourage you to think about how you might be a part of that ministry as well as we seek to serve God with our head, our hearts, and our hands. I invite our ushers to come forward at this time to receive God's tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Gracious God, as we gather in this holy place and see the beauty of all that you have made possible, we're grateful to you and thankful for your Holy Spirit that continues to allow us to be in ministry, to make your kingdom real and known in and through this church. Bless these gifts, multiply them in such a way that we can do far more than we could ever imagine on our own. To the glory of Christ, we offer these gifts. Amen. All right, kids, would you join me down front for some time together? All right, come on down. I want you guys to get in between the tables so you can see I brought something to show you today. I want to get everybody to get where you can see me, okay? Awesome. Good job. All right. I brought something back from a little trip I went on earlier this fall. I was thinking about you guys while I was on my trip, and I brought these to show you. Are you ready? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Can you see these big shells? Some are big, and some are not so big. Do you know what these shells' job was? Hmm. Anybody know what these shells' job was, Helen? To hold crabs, that's right. Well, which one of these do you think was the most important shell? Was it the, what do you think, Dylan? The smallest one? What do you think, Uriah? The biggest one? Anybody else have any thoughts? Lily, what do you think? The largest one? Well, let me ask it a different way. If you were a little crab and this was your home, do you think this would be the most important shell to you? If this was your house? I think it would be pretty important, right? If this was your house, that's probably important. If you were a really big crab, and this was your house, do you think this shell would be important to you? Yes, right? So it's not really about whether it's big or small. It's about how important it is to the one who used it, right? So this reminded me about this story that Dr. J is going to talk about today in worship. There was this lady who came to church, and she was going to give an offering, but she didn't have very much to give at all. Hers was very, very small compared to what some other people did. But what Jesus said was that hers was the most important because it meant so much to her. Just like the little shell would be important to a little crab, what we have to give is important. It doesn't matter how big or small, but because it means a lot to us. Right? And when we want to share that with God, God loves that. I see. So let's pray together. We'll ask God to help us use our gifts, and then we'll go up to Children's Church. All right? Will you guys help me pray? All right. Dear God, thank you for all the gifts we have. Help us to use them to bless others, bless others. No, matter how big or small. no matter how big or small in Jesus name we pray, in Jesus name we pray. Amen. amen all right let's go to children's church Friends, we've been looking toward the 200th anniversary of our church and planning for the future. And actually, Jeff, that's all right. The screen doesn't need to be down now. We can bring it down during the closing hymn. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, where was I? 
All right. <laughs> today, uh, we've been doing this generosity series, and today our focus is on generosity and sacrifice. And there's a, one story in the New Testament, uh, an observation that Jesus makes that captures in the most astounding way this whole notion of sacrifice and generosity. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Mark 12, verses 41 to 44. For those of you who are able, would you please stand in honor of the reading of the gospel? And listen now for the word of the Lord. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. Be seated. I need the ushers to help me at this point. If the ushers would come forward, don't be alarmed. We're not taking up another offering. <laughs> Just the opposite. You've never been invited to take something out of an offering plate before in a church, but now you're going to do that. Lee, if you can get that to the choir, that would be wonderful. We want you to take out of the offering plate one of these envelopes, please. Whoops. Everybody needs one. Don't forget the folks on the sides. Just kind of circulate those as best you can. I'm going to take that one right there. So take one out of the offering plate. And I'm going to ask you what my wife sometimes says to me. If you can multitask, I'm going to keep going, okay? So we're going to, we're going to multitask here. So I want you to pay attention as you're getting this. I'll refer back to this and let you know what I you'll have a chance to really focus on what you're picking up in just a moment. Who among us uh, here knows when this particular sanctuary, little church history of State Street here, little State Street trivia, when this sanctuary was built, what was the year this sanctuary was built? 1895, right? We began in 1821 sanctuary, 1842 the second sanctuary, 1895 was this magnificent sanctuary. Some of you know it was originally oriented toward, that was where the pulpit was, in front of that big rose window there. These were Sunday school classes and spaces up in this area here. I don't know if you know, I would not have known, but I looked in the church history that was written by Joyce Robertson's brother, Dr. Bennett, some years ago now, and this sanctuary, anybody know how much this sanctuary cost to build in 1895? $20,400. Now where's Alice Nicely? She's on the trustees. I'm trusting that we have it insured for a little more than that. Is, is that your understanding, Alice? We've got it, it's worth a little bit more than $20,400. You add to that, if you look at these beautiful stained glass windows, there's 150 panels, oh, excuse me, 105 panels in these stained glass windows. They were designed and made and installed in this sanctuary for the, the whopping cost of $1,000. Alice, once again, we have them insured for more than that, do we not? We do. So $21,400 is what this sanctuary cost in 1895. 
the beautiful round window where actually the altar area was originally, the, the tree in that window. When I first came here, sometimes people would come in to see the sanctuary, and, and then sometimes our confirmation class would come in here, and, and I was waxing eloquent on the symbolism of that tree. I was talking to them about the Garden of Eden and the tree of good and evil. I was talking to them about the tree in the book of Revelation, you know, that is for the healing of the nations, all of this do, do you realize none of that is true? I didn't know that. Somebody had to correct me. Actually, I read it in Dr. Bennett's history. That tree up there, according to the history of this church, that tree is an apple tree that was on this property, and it gave its life so that this sanctuary could be built, and they captured that tree uh, in the window. So really, I was half right. It is a tree of life. It gave life. It gave life to us in this beautiful space. You see, I knew that this sanctuary had been, been built in 1895. What I didn't know was, and discovered in Dr. Bennett's history, I did not know what had happened in 1893. Do you know what happened in 1893 in this country? In 1893, the worst economic depression that had ever struck the United States happened in 1893. Think about that. And this church builds this sanctuary two years later. Dr. Bennett says this, he said this community was still recovering from the worst economic depression the nation had ever experienced. And he said this, as generally is true, most of the pledges were in small amounts, and it was indicated by a letter from the treasurer at that time, Tom W. Carpenter. Holly Vaughn is one of our treasurers. Now, Holly, you, you get to send letters out to people if they don't pay up. Did you know that? Did we talk about that? Oh, Holly's not here. Y'all let Holly know about that. That's in the fine print. But the treasurer at that time sent to Mrs. Nellie Thomas, he sent her a letter asking her to pay her $1 pledge toward liquidating the entire indebtedness. Anybody know how long it took them to pay for this wonderful sanctuary? Six years. 1901, the indebtedness on this sanctuary was complete. Now, one of my favorite things to do with the confirmation class uh, is we get to come into the sanctuary and over to those double doors, that go out on to, to 11th Street, if you look up, there is an attic access right above where those doors are. And actually, up there is a room. It's very, very cool. It used to be a Sunday school class, believe it or not. I still can't figure out how they got up there, but there are other Sunday school rooms and, that were accessed up above. All of this was Sunday school space. And every year we take the confirmands, those that want to climb the ladder, up into that attic space. And it's like an octagon up there. Beautiful. You can tell the, the wallpaper. In its day, it would have just been magnificent. And there's things stored up there. And we allow the confirmands to always get to take one thing. They can get one thing and bring it down with them. And most of them, most of them pick up one of these offering envelopes or some other token when they're up there and come back down. Do you know when State Street last built a structure to the footprint of this physical structure. The year. The year that the education building was built. Who said? Do you know when the education building was built? Everything behind us, been remodeled, been fixed up through the years. The education building was built in 1929. Think about that. All right, history buffs. I hope you're a history buff. This sermon's really boring you if you're not. I love history if you hadn't picked up on that. 1929, what happened in this country in 1929? The Great Depression, right? 
The Great Depression began in 1929, lasted 10 years. Who, who wants to share their name? What name do you have and what's the date on your envelope and what's the amount? Anybody? I'll start. Edward Henderson, five cents. Edward Henderson, five cents. What's the date on that envelope? Uh, 1936. 1936. Carol Pearson, 10 cents. 1936. Yes. Anna Joe, you raise your hand. One dollar. They were well off. Yeah. I'm not kidding. Yes, Mary Alice. Oh, wow. Yes, Jamie, what do you got? Nineteen. Mine is Jean Thomas, a nickel, five cents. What's the date on that, Ann? Uh, 1934. 1934. Now, folks, if we see things the way the world sees things and not the way Jesus sees things, then we'll just totally miss, we'll totally miss an eco not just an economic lesson, but a spiritual lesson. Some of us might look at the amount. I mean, come on, Gene Thomas, a nickel, really? That's nothing, is what I'm tempted to say. But I would be so wrong. And you would be too. You see, Jesus in Mark 12, in Mark 12, he has entered into, he is in what was called the court of the women. The women could, sorry about this, ladies, you couldn't go everywhere in the temple, and there was a court of the women, and in the court of the women there was these series of colonnades, and along these series of colonnades there was these 13 boxes for collecting the offering in the court of the women, and they were shaped like a trumpet from the top. It was real small. I'm not going to touch a bell. I'm not crazy. <laughs> But if you can imagine a real small neck and, and folding out at the bottom, you could put a coin in and it would drop and the, the offering could be collected in the bottom. And because of the shape like a trumpet, those offering boxes, 13 of them were called the trumpets. And it's how people paid their offerings in the temple. And each trumpet had a specific purpose. Trumpet number five, if you wanted to support the wood that would burn the sacrifices in the temple, you could put your money in trumpet five. If you wanted to, in, to support the incense that was burned in the temple, you could put your money in trumpet six, and so on and so forth. There were specific purposes. And Jesus and his disciples are outside this area, and they're watching. They're watching people come and put their offering in. Evidently, it was the strong temple, strong future capital campaign that weekend. I don't know. But he's watching. And people are coming and he says there are people who put in large amounts because they have they're very wealthy and they put in large amounts and then he say, sees I'm I'm sure his disciples didn't notice but he notices this one woman and she comes and she has two coins and she drops both coins in and in that instance Jesus says, "Did you see that?" Did you notice that? That woman has put in more than anyone else in the treasury. And his disciples must have said to themselves, my goodness, the master, he said a lot of crazy things to us, but this, this tops them all. What is he talking about? And he said, look, those that put in a lot, they have a lot and they have a lot left, but this woman, Everything she had, she gave it. Everything she had. This woman, 
Jesus points to her and she represents, she embodies what it is to give sacrificially. She embodies what it is for any of us to live by faith. How could she do it? I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have been in some of the church meetings here at State Street in 1895 and in 1929. Are you with me? I mean, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to hear, because don't you know, don't you, 1893, economic depression, 1929, economic depression, can't you hear the naysayers? Can't you hear the, I told you so, you knew, I, I was, I just want you, I don't mean to bring this up, but I, I, was, I was against it from the beginning. I saw, I saw this, I knew, it's always uncertain, I don't know what you people were thinking. The church we had was good, what was wrong with the church that we had? Right? I mean, can you imagine the finger pointing? And I'm a pastor, so, you know, I was interested. I wanted, I wanted to know who was the pastor at, during, during that time. As I'll tell you, friends, I'm, the, I'm like Paul. Paul said, I feel, I feel the stress of the churches. I, I feel the weight of the churches. Because Paul loved them. And I love this place, and I want you to know no pastor ever, ever, ever would do anything that would jeopardize the future of a church and put its witness at risk. And so I wanted, I wanted to know who in the world was pastor back then. And I want you, it was interesting, and you can look it up if you don't believe me. I've got the book somewhere. They're in the library. It's interesting, the only years in the history of State Street that we don't know who the pastor was is the years 1894 to 1896. Think about that. Now, I don't know if they ran him off. I don't know if they said to themselves, look, we are not to utter his name ever again. It will not be printed in the record of this great church. I don't know. All I know is you go and look, and for some reason there's no one listed as the pastor for those years. You know who the pastor was in 1929? Bill does. Bill Napier's grandfather. What was his name, Bill? Baxter. Baxter. Granddaddy. Granddaddy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Reverend Doctor, actually, to most people, but that's all right. You know, it was actually his grandfather's second. He was at State Street four years previously, and then he came back. I'm just wondering if he said, look, we got to have somebody. We need you to go. He came, he's the only pastor that came back to State Street after having left. It was Bill's grandfather. Bill, I don't know this. I don't have any record. There's no way for me or anybody else to know. And I don't know if it was your grandfather or some other saint. I think it was probably a woman finally stood up in one of those meetings and said, somebody please, excuse me. I don't know who the saint was, but somebody finally raised their hand and they said, excuse me, when has God stopped being God? When? When has God ever let this church down? I don't care if it's the Great Depression. What difference does it make? Right? I don't know who that was. But somebody at some point, God bless their soul, and it probably was his grandfather who said, look, what are y'all worried about? You think God would bring us this far just to forsake us now? And I don't know about everybody, but I know Gene Thomas said, you know what, he's right. And I got a nickel. I had Maury Hills in the first service. He gave a dime, right? I want to make a prediction. I'm not an economist. I'm trying to be a pastor, but you don't have to be an economist 
to know that what I'm about to tell you will be true. I understand the stock market's doing great, and we're all thankful for that. I got a 401k. Thank you, Jesus, right? I'm riding the wave. But guess what? I don't know when. You don't know when. But you know as well as I do what goes up must come down. And I don't know if it'll be 2018 or 2019, 2020. My, my hunch is it'll be right when we break ground. That's my best guess. But you know what? This church, this church of any church in this community understands what it's like to face an economic crisis. We've been there, done that. Twice! And everything that we see around us is because people didn't give up. They didn't quit. You see, in 1893, by the grace of God, Jean Thomas and people like her, they didn't flinch. In 1929, Bill's grandfather and the saints there, they didn't flinch. So I'm not praying for an economic crisis, don't get me wrong. I said that at the early service. One of the ladies just looked at me. You want, I mean, I don't know. Maybe we need an economic crisis. We, we do well. Evidently, we do well in this place. When we have to trust God and we have to trust each other and we have to help each other along the way. Evidently, we, we thrive in that situation. So if it comes in 2018, 2019, 2020, what difference does it make? By the grace of God, why? Why would we even flinch? Amen? Let's pray. And as you pray, I want to invite you, that envelope that I gave to you, I hope, I hope you'll take that with you. I hope you'll put it in your Bible or wherever you do your devotions. And when the economic crisis comes, and it will come at some point, I want you to have that, and I want you to look at the name, and I want that saint to remind you, hey, it's all right, hang on. It's going to be fine. We got through this before. You're going to get through it again. Let that be an encouragement to you. Just put that in your Bible. Use it as a source of encouragement. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we are among most, of, of, of all people, we are among your most blessed in this world, in this community. You shower upon us so lavishly the homes we live in, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, the food we eat. In our best moments, we're just so mindful of how you sustain us and bless us and give such good things to us. Oh God, we look around this sanctuary and we, we see the beauty of it and we give you gratitude for, for those that came before us who built this strong foundation here at State Street. And Lord, we're just trying to do our part as we take the next step in faith with you and we need you to help us to understand what our sacrifice needs to be, what it is that you're calling each of us do, to do and each of, as, as a church family what we are to do. So. We seek your guidance. We thank you that you have always been faithful in this place. So continue to guide us, to instruct us, alleviate uh, any fear or anxiety that we carry with us about the future. We thank you, O oh God. Teach us what it is to live by faith with you every day. As I close this prayer, on the count of three, I want you just to say out loud the name that's on that envelope card of yours. Dear God, we gather our voices with these saints who have gone on before us. One, two, three, Gene Thomas. As they trusted you, we trust you. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our brother and our friend, and all God's children did say, Amen.
I invite you to join in singing our hymn of discipleship this morning. It may be found in your red hymnal on page 399. Take my life and let it be. Will you please stand? Dear friends, we have, before we close, a very exciting announcement to make for you and with you. Uh, our capital campaign leadership team has been meeting uh, for several months now, since mid-August, in earnest. And uh, some of you, most of you are aware that we're looking at some improvements in our sanctuary, the ceiling, the flooring, a screen that doesn't have a mind of its own, uh, you know, things from that we'll be looking at a, a new multi ministry center, children's area behind us, gathering space, new choir room, restrooms, those kinds of things. And some of our campaign leadership team and other leaders in our church have already made their commitments known and we have gathered those together and we want to share that with you uh, this morning as a means of encouraging the rest of us in uh, what we might do. And so our goal for the campaign is $1.75 million, and we uh, are to date at this point. To date, we are at $1,360,924. All the green you see there represents pledges that we already have in toward the, the campaign. By the grace of God, we are 78% there already. And Larry Snyder and his wife Tamara and Paul and Joan Burrell, they're, they're in the back. Paul, Joan, they didn't make it out. They get back there in that comfortable back pew and it's hard to give it up. They're afraid somebody will take it. But Paul and Joan are right back there, but Larry and Tamara have given such good leadership. And Larry has a word that he wants to share with us today. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a good day. This is the day the Lord has made and we've been a long time uh, getting to this point. I do want to thank uh, Paul and Joan and uh, my wife Tamara, who's back there with a sore foot. Uh, she was so excited she started dancing. <laughs> and I told her stop, but that, <laughs> that Pentecostal girl just can't help herself sometimes. Um, this, is, uh, this is a remarkable day. I remember when uh, uh, the pastor asked whether we would help with the uh, campaign. Tamara and I had to think a long time about uh, whether to do this. 
Um, I don't like talking about money, and I certainly don't like asking folks for money. Now, I do have a few things to say to the governor about higher education and money, but... <laughs> Larry, we've got to keep moving here. Okay, I, <laughs> I digress. Um, but this is, uh, this is something that's been, uh, is very important to us as we have uh, thought about uh, our place in this congregation. Every Sunday, we stand here and we recite uh, the Apostles' Creed, and we say, I believe in the communion of saints. We say that. And what that means is that where we are now is in communion, in conversation with those saints who have gone before us and those who will come after us. We're in a long line. And uh, we are simply one part of that conversation. And today, uh, as we move forward in the future of this congregation, we're at a point where we are going to do our part. For those of you uh, who have been involved in the capital campaign thus far in any capacity uh, with any of the committees, if you'd raise